أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور أرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على على وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم فإن تنازعتم في شيء فردوه إلى الله والرسول إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد نصلي على I begin in Allah's name the beneficent the merciful all praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us this life and giving us the opportunity to recognize his infinite mercy and tonight as you know is one of those chosen blessed nights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this one night is better than a thousand months Laylatul Qadri Khayru Min Alfi Shahr, better than a thousand months. This is one of those nights, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that while we are seeking to submit to Him with genuine submission, with sincerity, while we approach our death, for none of us can escape it, that we meet it at a level that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us. That while we were on this earth, we fulfilled good obligations, obligations which lead us to do good things and obligations with which to avoid bad things. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us on this night of Qadr recognition and realization of what is true and what is false and that we submit only to that which is true and that we look carefully, sincerely because Allah created this universe in truth and nothing is more dear to us than truth. And the reason we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His messengers and His representatives who succeed the messengers, i.e. the Imams, is because they are in the truth, with the truth, of the truth, by the truth. As the famous statement of uh, Ammar ibn Yasser, as you know, when we talk about Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam, when he was asked in Safin, that you call yourself Amir al Mu'mineen and the, your enemy on the other side calls himself Amir al Mu'mineen, meaning the prince of the believers. Which one of you is true? Because both of you are fighting each other. In the Battle of Siffin, as you know, when Imam Ali salam asked Muawiyah to step down as the governor of Syria. And Imam Ali salam sends him to Ammar ibn Yasir. And Ammar replies, Ali ma'al haqq. وَحَقْ مَا Ali, Meaning the truth is with Ali and Ali is with the truth. Meaning that we should recognize where the truth lies. Not who is in the truth, where is the truth. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Tonight in the night of Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us for many reasons. One, the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was revealed in this blessed night. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it on the night of qadr. We have riwayat, plenty of them to show that all the scriptures that were revealed unto mankind were all revealed on the night of qadr. The Tawrat, the Zabur, the Injil, every scripture that was given unto mankind was revealed on this blessed night in its form, which is the purest form. Inshallah, I'll talk about it in the later nights of Laylatul Qadr with regards to how did the Quran come down, how was it compiled, and how did it come down in one night when we know it was revealed over a span of 23 years? How was it that it came on one night? What does it mean? We thought 27th of Rajab is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Holy Prophet, you know, with the mission to tell the world, Iqra bismi rabbika khalaq. So when was it? How is it? 
As a result, we have to talk about it. But tonight is the night of Qadr, the night in which the entire Quran was revealed and was given into the heart of the Holy Prophet tonight. Uh, can I request this microphone to be adjusted, please? It's, it's too much feedback. Salu ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. A slight reduction, if you don't mind, please. Thank you. Thank you. Besides being the night of Qadr, as we know, which is, of course, the greatest of nights, because Allah says it's better than a thousand months. Think about it. It's not better than a thousand nights, better than a thousand months. We should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this blessed month to grant us our wishes, to give us our desires. Because Allah guarantees that. He says, تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرِ Angels descend by the decree of Allah for the decree of mankind. All the obligations on earth and the night of Qadr are revealed by angels to deliver on earth. So while these revelations are coming down from the angelic beings every year, every night of Qadr, you and I should interject and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to intercede in our transactions and to help us to make the right choices so that we become truthful followers of the way Allah intended us to follow. As you know, tonight also is a very sad night for those of us who commemorate the 19th night tonight. Some commemorate it tomorrow. Regardless, it's the intent that counts that while we will discuss tonight and tomorrow the historical events that led to the unfortunate shahada of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib والسلام, and as a lesson for us to take that this great personality, nobody was greater in personality after the Prophet than Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wasalam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al-Muhammad. There was no greater friend, no greater beloved, no greater companion, no greater brother than Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam to his blessed messenger. No one could equal him. It's sad that in the annals of history, people say others were the best friends of the Prophet. It is sad that history has managed to place in its annals ideas that do not hold true historically because when we examine them, it cannot be. It's illogical. It's not a question of choosing a side. It's a question of submitting to the truth. And the truth is with Allah and the Messenger. Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ Who are the believers? They are the ones who believe in Allah and the Messenger. And they do not doubt. ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا وَجَاهَدُوا بِأَمْوَالِهِمْ وَأَنفُسِهِمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ They strive with their wealth and their selves for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Purely for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the annals of history, other than the Holy Prophet, in the period of the Holy Prophet, no one could equal that status than Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib None. And I'll show you some simple examples. All it takes is a few examples in comparatives for us to understand. But the reason I bring this tonight is that Imam Ali salam paid a hefty price. His family has paid the heftiest price on earth to ensure that the gate to the city of knowledge protects the city of knowledge. As the Prophet said, Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Aliyun Babuha. I am the city of knowledge, and Ali is his gate, is its gate. That when Imam Ali salam became that gate by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what a price he had to pay because Shaitan could not bring his Trojan horse into the city anymore for the gate was secured now you might say i'm a lover of ahlul bayt and i'm proposing this idea that the love of ali ibn abi talib is something that we have concocted because we have taken a certain school of thought no we would be foolish to say that we would be foolish to linger or to latch on to personalities 
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet did not guide us there. We would be foolish to put importance in a person where Allah and His Messenger did not put that importance. We would be foolish. We would be fooling ourselves. We would be cheating ourselves. And on Judgment Day, only to find out that we've been shortchanged and we have been shortchanging ourselves. Hmm? Allah says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا أَوَلَوْ كَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ يَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَى عَذَابِ السَّعِيرِ They say, Allah says in Quran, in Surah Luqman, when they are told, follow that which God revealed. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمُ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ Follow that which Allah has commanded you. This is قَالُوا بَلْ No. نَتَّبِعُوا مَا وَجَدْنَ عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا I follow what my forefathers followed. I follow what my father followed. Which is fine. It's logical. Human beings tend to follow what their fathers follow and what their mothers follow. It's logical. But here Allah is questioning us. أَوَلَوْ كَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ يَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَىٰ عَذَابِ السَّعِيرِ Even if the devil, the evil forces, take your parents to the fire of hell, to the punishment, you'll follow your parents? What a question Allah is asking. This is a question you and I need to ponder on in these nights. For the world, for I'm addressing not to my community. If the world is listening, I address this to the world. For this is a matter of truth. And this truth shall be prevalent, as Allah says in Surah Isra. قُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقِّ Truth is ever prevalent. False is ever vanishing. So Allah in the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, verse 59, Allah says, Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu, ati'u allaha wa ati'u al-rasool wa ulil amri minkum. I will translate. O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those vested with authority from among you. The verse continues, If you have a dispute, even a small amount, return to Allah and His Messenger if you truly believe in God in the Day of Judgment. What a profound verse. That tonight while we commemorate the momentous shahada of a man who Allah blessed a birth in the Kaaba. Historically, no one was given that. Now you might say, wait, 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 you're really raising this man above the Prophet, you know, because even the Prophet wasn't born in the Kaaba. No. No one can supersede the Prophet. Let's not fool ourselves. Even Imam Ali salam, when he's asked, who has given you this? He says, my Lord and my Prophet. Who taught you how to fight and to defend and to be so wise and to be so just and to learn this deen the way you have? He said, my brother, my prophet, Rasulullah has taught me this. I was like a she-camel that followed him even up the mountains to be taught by him like a camel being suckled from its mother, Imam Ali alayhi salam says. So let's not fool ourselves into thinking that we're presenting Imam Ali better than the Prophet. Anyone who dares to say that Imam Ali salam, is equal in status or greater than the Prophet has ceased to be a Muslim, period. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a being who is the Furqan, the dividing point when it comes to haq and batil. You might say, isn't the Prophet the dividing point? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He is that dividing line between Islam and no Islam. But there comes a degree within Islam that you and I have to strive to get closer to Allah. And if we don't purify ourselves, we use him. If we don't purify ourselves, we will remain, as we say, weak Muslims, lost sheep. We will kill, like what's happening in Syria today, what's happening in Bahrain. You wonder why Muslims are killing each other? Hmm? You ever wonder why that? How come Europe? You know, if you ever travel in Europe, there are many countries in Europe that are so tiny, some of them are just a few kilometers, one side to the other. How come they're not killing each other? Why, they're more civilized? Why, they know what's right and what's wrong, and we are just a herd of cattle that doesn't know which way to go? Hmm? You think that's the reason? Why is it that the Muslim world is so on its throats? 
If you study this, you'll be amazed to see how the forces of the enemies from outside and from inside are working tirelessly to ensure that the truth does not be prevalent on this earth. Subhanallah. Believe me, when the Holy Prophet says, Man kuntum mawla fahada aliyun mawla. Whoever I am the master of, this Ali is his master, that's the day when Iblis's knees trembled, to use the terms. Why? Because when the city of knowledge is secured, what do you do? You cannot penetrate it. You cannot alter the words of God like the preceding people did. You cannot create false representatives. Much harder. You cannot blur it out because you see, you may have a prevalence of blurrings, but as long as the truth is prevalent, it's very hard to take authority on it. We find historically before, we find all the scriptures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent were adulterated in certain forms. And this is not a Muslim perspective. All schools of thought, religions believe that there were intrusions by human beings giving their ideas. The Quran, 14 centuries, after all the attacks on Islam, and you can see it today, after all these attacks, 14 centuries of constant strikes against Islam, and today, in public, in public, openly, we are being branded as terrorists, you find Islam continues to grow. Why? Are people demented that this religion is so supposedly so violent? Why are people accepting it? Because there is the essence of truth in it. The essence of truth in the Quran and in Islam are so clear, it takes a little bit of understanding to realize where the truth lies. There are stories of atheists, there are stories of Jesuit priests who open the Quran and they read it and they say, this is not the words of man. This is the word of God. Ma hadha kalamul bashar. Hadha kalamullah, as the Meccan said, when the Holy Prophet posted Surah Al-Ikhlas on the Kaaba. Subhanallah. So what does Allah say to us in the Quran? O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those vested with authority. The key operative question is, who are those vested with authority? There's an irony here that I'd like for us to ponder on. Because the next verse continues, if you have a doubt, you have a dispute, return to Allah and His Prophet. If you want, if you believe in God in the Day of Judgment, go back. Don't go elsewhere. Don't go into a gathering. Don't go into a shura gathering. Don't go anywhere. Go back to Allah and His Prophet, Allah says. Ask them, what did they say? Who is it? And the key operative in this sentence is that the ita'at is mentioned twice. But there are three groups. Meaning we have to obey three groups, but the submission, obedience word, ita'at is mentioned twice. So what is that third group? And the third group is in the present. Wa'uli al-amri min kum. You're present now. Now why am I speaking about this? You might say, look brothers, you know, we are a Muslim ummah. We have difference of opinion. I'm not talking about that. I don't care about the difference of opinion. Differences are here to stay. Even among the schools, the same school of thought, we have difference of opinion. Show me two people, even identical twins, who agree on everything. Not even identical twins agree on everything. Difference of opinion is healthy, it's good, it's here to stay, and we have no intentions of eradicating it completely. That's the spice to life. We have to have difference of opinion. It's healthy. The contrarian view is good. But Allah says, bring your arguments forward if you're truthful. For on judgment day, I will hold you liable. By your arguments, what did you use to submit to me? Who did you follow to submit to me? And my focus tonight is not about this. It's about role models. That when we talk about Ahlul Bayt and role models, brothers and sisters, I will, re I will explain why Imam Ali salam is so important in so many ways, not to elevate his status, because no matter what I do, I can't elevate his status. His status is already elevated, even if I am silent. It's not that. 
It's the recognition of an elevated status so that you and I can have certainty in our hearts to understand who are the ulil amr so that you and I can prescribe ourselves the conditions that Allah has placed us upon so that these treacheries that are taking place in the world today would not have happened. I was recently, many years back, recently, many years back, I was in Syria, a city bustling with life. Today, it's a war-torn city. Go to Yemen, war-torn city. Go to Egypt, problems. Go everywhere we call the Arab Spring. Why is this all happening? Because we've been taken as slaves to the limits where these kings and monarchs who are being fed daily to be our masters and to be made fools of that they pretend to be representing Islam when they are making a mockery of Islam even as pretentious leaders and our lives are being taken and our children are being massacred and our fathers and mothers are being massacred all because we have submitted to something which Allah has forbidden us to, for, to submit to. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. What does it mean, Ulil Amr Minku? I'm just going to go very quickly. Can it be the king of today? Can you imagine the Sauds being Ulil Amr Minku? You want to insult yourself in the mirror? Put them as those people. You want an insult even to a person who's half a brain? To say that that's my ulil amri minkum, I might as well take this Quran and throw it, it's got no meaning to me. It's an insult to intelligence and humanity. Then who is the ulil amr? All you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those vested with authority. Who can it be by the sentence? Nobody can be the third one except the one who is chosen by Allah and the Prophet and their actions and transactions must be parallel to the ways of Allah and His Messenger. Otherwise, they don't, do not qualify to be Ulil Amr Minku. People ask me, how do you know the Imam of the time is here? This ayah is in itself revealing it. Wa Ulil Amr Minku, that there is an Ulil Amr today, even in the state of Ghaibah. Do we ever bother to ask the Prophet, what did you think? Look at the irony. We have successors to the Prophet. Some say the Prophet never appointed anyone. That also is an insult to Islam. That if the Messenger of Allah is a complete messenger, that he did not leave a stone unturned even about how we should go to the toilet and relieve ourselves, the Prophet has given us instructions. You think he will not leave us instructions on how to have leaders? Does this make sense? You think you and I can just cherry pick leaders because they're taller or shorter or their shoe sizes are larger? Hmm? You think Islam is that kind of a joke religion? I'd rather be an atheist then. I think they got more reasons. They're more logical. It's absurd that if leadership can be left in the hands of humanity, then I beg to differ and see the carnage for 14 centuries. You go to Karbala and see how our blessed Imam is being butchered. When the Prophet said, Hussein no minni, wa anamin al Hussein. Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Lahmuhum lahmi, wa damuhum dami. Ana harbun liman harabahum, wa silmun liman salamahum. Famous hadith accepted by all Muslims on earth. Even Orientalists accept this hadith. So what did the Prophet say? Their flesh is my flesh. Hmm? And I make peace with those who make peace with them. And I make war with those who make war with them. Who was killed in Karbala, if not the Prophet? Hmm? Who was killed among the Ahlul Bayt by Mamun and Harun al Rashid and the Abbasid and the Umayyads? Who did they kill, if not the Prophet? Tell me. And by the same breath, we can dare to stand in front of Allah and say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. How can we say that? That's an insult that Shaitan is laughing all the way to hell and says, You fools, how did you mix oil and water together? I'm saying it sincerely, brothers and sisters, that tonight the Shahada of Amir al-Mu'mineen stands as a lesson not to look down on our brothers of other schools, but to look at the ultimate role models and to say to our brethren of the Ummah, all of us, let us go forward and unite between the five major schools of thought and say our Quran is intact, our Salah is intact in most cases, the Kaaba is intact, our Prophet is intact. What more do you want? It is upon us to exhort upon each other, not to damn each other, to exhort. Tawasaw bil haq, tawasaw bil sabr. You find Imam Ali was that personality, let me describe him tonight. And I'll tell you, 
that the reason he was killed, as we know historically, the Khawarij killed him, they say. Ibn Muljim came from Egypt to kill him with a poison sword. But the Khawarij were created, supported, and promoted by Muawiyah, Ibn Abi Sufyan. If you read any history, you will see that he created them, he supported them, he protected them, and he promoted them. Anybody who says otherwise, with due respect, you need to re-examine history. So when Allah says, Uli Lamri Minkum, there is a special group of people chosen by Allah, and that the Holy Prophet and Allah are the only ones who can choose. And I give this example very clearly. Even Musa alayhi salam, who is a Rasul, Nabi. Rasul, you know, is a higher status than a Nabi, one who gives laws to mankind. That when Musa alayhi salam is commanded by Allah, اذهب إلى فرعون إنه تغى Go to Fir'aun, he has exceeded his boundaries. We find Musa alayhi salam says, وَجْعَلِّي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِ هَارُونَ أَخِي Give me a helper as my brother Harun to go to Fir'aun. Why didn't Musa just appoint him and say, okay, I'm a prophet, I'm a rasul, I'm a nabi. I'll appoint you, O Harun. Even then in the Quran, Allah shows even Musa, who is a prophet that God spoke directly to, does not have the authority to appoint on his own ideas, though he knows Harun is already a prophet. Subhanallah. He's already a prophet. My God, you can't take it higher. You cannot take a better example than that. You find even then Harun does not join Musa until Allah commands him that yes, you and your brother go. I authorize both of you. What authority does a human being have? The Ulil Amri Minkum cannot be the president of a community, cannot be the Imam of the community. No, cannot be the king of the communities like you have in Bahrain and Saud. No, these are the antithesis of leadership in Islam. Opposite. You want to know what the evil ones are? Look at them. So then who is it? It's a command of Allah. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. So we look back and we see that the Prophet mentioned there will be 12 after me. Follow them, one after the other. I will mention them, the Prophet says, name after name. But history has tried to erase it. They say, Umar ibn As, look at his works. You know, he was chosen as the governor of Egypt. He is the man who sent Ibn Muljim from Egypt to go kill. Now some say, no, no, no. No, the Khawarij went to Egypt to kill Umar ibn As. Yeah, very funny. You send a guy from Kufa who doesn't even know how Umar ibn As looks. And then he goes and strikes another man because he didn't know who it was. But somehow they all figured out who Ali ibn Abi Talib was. Hmm, interesting. These concoctions in history are designed as smoke screens to make us think otherwise. Because they knew the impact of killing the brother, the successor to the Holy Prophet in Islam is a huge impact. That's why you notice when Yazid ibn Muawiyah kills Imam Hussein, the rest of the Khalifas killed the Imam silently. They wouldn't dare take them on a, on a battlefield. They wouldn't dare because the demise of the Umayyad Empire came after that. That Muawiyah's only son, Yazid, who ruled, he had a dream that his generation should rule, but not to be. Marwan ibn Hakam's family takes over the Umayyad Empire. And who was Marwan ibn Hakam, brothers and sisters? You want to see tragedy, insults? Hakam and his son Marwan were exiled by the Prophet kicked out of Medina. Don't you dare come back to Islam, you troublemakers. Can you imagine? He becomes a Khalifa. You want to see insult added to injury? Spell it out. Now, I don't care what school of thought we belong to. I ask this question to myself. How could I stand on judgment day to Allah and say, oh Allah, I accepted them. Allah says, I condemned them. You accepted them? And you have the audacity to say, How many times did you say that to me? Did you not raise your hands and say, Allahu Akbar? Did you not agree that in the Quran, Allah says, La bayna wa rasuli. Do not go ahead of Allah and His Messenger. Did you not say that? Did you not accept it? How did you do this one? 
Allah says, you think we can fool Allah? I feel sorry for the world that fools itself on Judgment Day to find itself in a mirage thinking it's an oasis when it's a mirage. It's a mirage. You take Imam Ali alayhi salam, Umar ibn As, you know what he does in Egypt? When he conquers Egypt, becomes the governor, there were thousands, 5,000 plus books on science, chemistry, physics. You know what he does? He makes a ruling. He says, if any of these books conform with the Quran, we don't need it because Quran is sufficient. And if they don't conform with the Quran, burn it. So notice, both ways burn it. This is a man who was the governor of Egypt under Muawiyah. And he burnt 5,000 books. When Imam Ali salam hears this, he writes him a letter. He says, how can it not conform with the Quran? For your destruction of knowledge is blasphemous. It's an abomination. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has conferred knowledge upon mankind that even the Quran begins with Iqra bismi rabbika lidhi qalaq. Read, acquire knowledge. How do you burn knowledge? In Alexandria, in Egypt, they say 5,000 books were burnt and they were all sent to the hot springs where people were taking baths and five and thousands of these books were burnt at the... The, the fire that was burning to heat the water in these what we call bath houses. Umar ibn As did this. Umar ibn As is the man who made Muawiyah who he is. Umar ibn As used to sit with Muawiyah. Many times the Prophet used to stop and look at them. He would stare at them and walk away. And he says to Ibn Abbas, he says, when you see these two sitting together, sit between them because fitna is coming. The bala is coming. We have hundreds of hadith on the troubles of these people. Amr ibn As was the governor, as you know, Imam Ali alayhi salam sends Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, the son of Abu Bakr. Muhammad, as you know, was beloved to Imam Ali alayhi salam. He called him his own son. And Umar ibn As kills him. Not only kills him, cuts him to pieces and takes his body and places it into the belly of a donkey and sends it back. Some say he burnt it right then and there. Subhanallah. Can you imagine? This is how Amr ibn As was. Now see the opposite of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. What kind of person was he? I'm going to look what Allah says in the Quran. This is Uli Lamri Minkum, brothers and sisters. As Muslims, we have an obligation. And tonight, the night of Qadr, I'd like to address this clearly upon us as a community. As a community. Because as a community, we have to be just. We have to be loving, we have to be caring. When I say I love Imam Ali alayhi salam, I love him because he acted with justice and equity. I hear some noise, if you can ask me. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Surah An-Nisa, verse 58. Inna Allaha ya'murukum an tu'addu al-amanati ila ahliha. وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَنْ تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ نِعِمَّا يَعِيدُكُمْ بِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا Surely Allah commands you to make over trusts to their owners and that when you judge between people, you judge with justice. Allah admonishes you with what is excellent. Surely Allah is seeing, hearing. Now let's go to the justice of Imam Ali alayhi salam. You know when the Prophet was leaving Mecca. In Mecca, people did not have banks. People used to keep their treasures with trustworthy people. And there were a few. The most trustworthy was the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was known as Sadiq al-Ameen. Trustworthy, honest, truthful. He had a lot of wealth, jewels, money. Gold that he kept for who? I want you to think about that. The very people who persecuted him. The very people who were spending money to kill him. The very people who drove him out of Mecca. He was keeping their treasuries. Now imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a message to him through Jibreel that Allah has commanded you to leave Mecca and move to Medina. You might think that the urgency of the situation is such 
that the people of Mecca have given up their human rights by attacking him, and therefore he reserves the right to embezzle their wealth, like we do today in international courts. If we don't like you, we take all your assets from your country. Like some countries, sadly, their assets have been gobbled and stolen only because there's some excuse of somebody who they call a terrorist. It's enough of a reason for them to embezzle their wealth. Or like us in our societies, that when we have a chance to embezzle the insurances, or we have a chance to cheat the banks, although the banks themselves are cheaters, but that doesn't mean we have the right to cheat them. As you know, two wrongs don't make a right. But you find the Holy Prophet does not take the wealth. He gives it behind to the second most trustworthy person on earth, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib wasalam, and says, you hold on to this while I leave for Medina, you remain behind and give it back to its rightful owners. What does Allah say? Allah commands you to make over trust to their owners, not whether it's a kafir or a non-kafir, not whether it's a believer or non-believer. A human being, even if he's your enemy, you return his trust. Do we, do we follow those principles? Honestly, there's no use in remembering Imam Ali salam in this blessed night. If you and I don't make a resolution tonight to say that if I'm cheating somebody, if I owe somebody money, I borrowed some money to some, from somebody, pay them back. They, they keep their promises. Allah says in the Quran, they keep their promises. We'll talk about promises. Look at what Imam Ali salam speaks about with regards to promises. He says, listen to this, while he's the Khalifa of the time, he sends a letter to his governor and says the following. He says, as far as collection of land revenue, land revenue, when people pay taxes on the land, is concerned, you must always keep in view the welfare of the taxpayer. Who cares about taxpayers today? A million homes in this country have been foreclosed and the very banks that have messed up the economy of our country are giving each other billions of dollars in bonuses while a million homes are being taken and people are increasing in shelters just the other day i was at wise and a man a white caucasian man walks in well groomed walks in and says can you help me find a shelter i said shelter for what he says i have no home I said, why? He says, I haven't paid my taxes. They seized my home. I have no home to go to. Can somebody show me where the shelter is? This is a white Caucasian man. Usually it's the black one. Mm. It's that bad. Imam says, which is of primary importance than the taxes themselves. And as actual taxable capacity of people rests on fertility of land, Therefore, more attention should be paid to fertility of land and property of the subjects than to the collection of revenues. Can you find a man more just than that? Then Imam Ali salam says, when you go collect the taxes, see how fertile his land is. The more fertile it is, the more you collect from them. Otherwise, you cannot touch their land. This is Adalat. Listen to what happens when he's starting to give money from the treasury. He's the Khalifa of the time. You want to see the leader that Allah says, Wali Lamri Minkum? Watch this. A man comes to him, his name is Uthman bin Hanifa, who was a companion of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Uthman bin Hanifa is saying to Imam Ali alayhi salam that by your justice in giving the black and the white and the brown equal share, these rich ones are going to Muawiyah. They're joining him against you. Look at the eloquent reply of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He says, I cannot allow rich and influential persons to exploit the society of the Muslim state and to run an inequitable and unjust system of distribution of wealth and opportunities. I cannot for a moment tolerate this leadership. You know, it resonates in your heart. Wow, you are the Khalifa of the time. You're not pandering to anybody. You're not a sycophant on anybody's grounds. You are simply a man of justice and equity and truthfulness. These are the kinds of people Allah wants us to follow as Uli Lamri Minkum. He says, this is public wealth. It comes from the masses. It must go back to them. The rich and powerful persons have not created any wealth. Interesting. You think, no, no. It's usually the rich and the wealthy who create wealth. Imam disagrees. Usually, by the way, if you ever study economic standards, it's never the rich that create wealth. It's the poor that create wealth, but the rich have taken it. 
He says, the rich and powerful persons have not created any wealth. They have merely sucked it from the masses and after paying the taxes, what is left to them is many times more than what they pay to the state and they are welcome to retain it, Imam says. Had all this been private property, I would have gladly distributed it in the same manner. So far as their desertion is concerned, meaning going to Muawiyah, I am glad they have deserted me. So far as the usefulness or services of this disabled persons and have-nots is concerned. Now he's helping the have-nots, remember. He's helping the poor. He's helping the indigent. He's helping the slaves. Look how Imam replies. I want us to think about this, please. Because in our societies here, the same situation is for us. Many a times we latch on to the wealthy, thinking it's the wealthy that will give us security. Watch what Imam replies. He says, as far as the usefulness or services of these disabled persons and have-nots is concerned, remember, I am not helping them to secure their services. I fully well know they are unable to serve me. I help them because they cannot help themselves and they are, much, they are as much human beings as you and I. May Allah help me to do my duty as he wishes me to do. Look at the answer. Imam doesn't care. Muawiyah amasses so much wealth that he takes all the treasuries. If you go in history, you find Imam Hassan, his son, after Imam Ali is shaheed. Imam Hassan rises against Muawiyah. Imam Hassan is an army ready to strike Muawiyah. Muawiyah in the night pays top money and he buys out the people on the other side. That the next day when Imam is ready to ride, there was mutiny in his army and they took an axe and they struck him on his blessed thigh and Imam had to stop this attack on Muawiyah. This continues historically over and over and over. Tonight, my brothers, in this night of Qadr, I want you to remember who this blessed Amir al-Mu'mineen was. Tomorrow we'll discuss him more. His ibadah after the Holy Prophet was second to none. They say Imam Zain al-Abideen who had what we call bent knees, bent knees, because he used to do sujood for so long. That's why it's called Zain al-Abideen. When people come to me and say, Yabna Rasulillah, we are so impressed by your ibadah, O Zain al Abidin. Historians, all historians, doesn't matter which school of thought, revere Imam Zain al Abidin to such a high status, I have never heard anything other than that. You know what Imam Zain al Abidin replies? He said, I am ashamed when you give me these accolades. For my grandfather, Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, was better in his sujood. My grandfather was better in his sujood. I am ashamed to be given this title. Look at the Imam. Can you find people like that in this world? They say Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he would go into sujood, he was only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know the whole Sufi school, Sufism? You know where its origin, although Sufism is not accepted in general by our schools of thought, but its origin of all the aesthetics in Islam who have taken pathways to become closer to Allah through worship, their master is Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Imam Ali alayhi salam's wisdom, we'll discuss it in these next few nights. Wisdom, hikmah, ability to explain the Quran, second to none after the Prophet. Second to none. He saved so many situations where people were going to be killed. Imam interjects and brings justice. His love for humanity, though his right was taken, Though his appointment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was taken, he never stopped doing the work of Allah. That when he was in Safin, Imam was on the verge of destroying Muawiyah. Yet in the battle, in the middle of the battlefield in Safin, historians say that Imam Ali alayhi salam looks up in the sky and he is looking for the prayer time and his companions ask him, Amir al-Mu'mineen, we're in the thick of this battle. He said, we are looking for the time of Salah. They keep up prayers, Allah says. They keep up prayers, even Isa alayhi salam says. Right? Imam 
I have been enjoined prayer and zakat. Imam Ali alayhi salam, on the battlefield, he's looking up and says, when is my prayer time? When the companions say we are in the middle of the battle, Imam says, why are we fighting if not to keep this salah? For the other side wants to eradicate it. The other side wants to abolish it. The other side wants to damage it. Look at religions today. Subhanallah, great religions. They have no rules and regulations even on prayers. The major religions, if you examine them, the rules have been eradicated. Muslims are the most prayerful people in the world. I'm not saying it to be arrogant or proud. I'm saying it practically as truth. Travel anywhere in the world, brothers and sisters. Even if you're not Muslim, examine who prays in public. You will see it's the Muslims who pray in the airports, who pray, who pray on, on, at work, who pray at travel times. These are the Muslims who pray. Why? Imam Ali is showing we're going to battle to stop this man from eradicating this. That today the entire 2 billion Muslim population understands the importance of Salah. We may not give credit to him, but we know where credit lies. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. My brothers and sisters, Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he fought Muawiyah, Muawiyah was on the verge of destruction. Muawiyah played a trick. And one of those persons that he used was Ash'ath ibn Qais, who is known as a famous Khawarij. As you know, the name Khariji, which is singular, Khawarij is plural, were the people who exited from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the known as Khawarij, Imam Ali alayhi salam exposed three groups of people when he became a leader in public. Three groups, we'll talk about it next time. When he fought this group, one of them was the Khawarij. They were so ignorant, but they looked so pious that when you looked at them, you felt sorry for them because they were always in worship. We have them today. They're strapping themselves with bombs, going into the harams and killing people. Same kind, same template. They come from the same batch. They haven't gone away. Don't think they've gone away. Although Imam Ali salam killed most of them in Nahrawan, only nine were left. Out of the entire army, only nine were left. Imam says, they are a confused bunch. They're not bad. They're a confused bunch. And those who are doing the bad things today, they're a confused bunch too. They're being bought and sold today in the world to kill us. These conversations are for you and I to ponder that God forbid I should become like one of them. How do I avoid becoming like one of them? I hold on to Uli Lamar Minkum. I hold on to the command of Allah in the Quran and say, I will not follow anyone except the one Allah has chosen. So you find that when the Khawarij were created, there was this man known as Ibn Muljim. Ibn Muljim was a lazy man. He was in Kufa. And when he was in Kufa, in fact, historians say that when he entered Kufa, Imam Ali Alayhi had a roster. Anybody who entered Kufa used to sign in the roster and come in, in the gates of Kufa. Imam, when he sees this, he says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. My killer has entered the precincts of the city of Kufa. How did he know this? Allah says, وَمَا تَدْرِ نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٍ You don't know on which land you will die. How does Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam know it? Because Allah gives it. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَعْ They cannot know of this knowledge except what Allah gives them. And yes, Imam Ali alayhi salam even told, مَيْثَمْ تَمَّارْ Hey, Maytham, you want to know where you will be martyred? Which tree will be used to be martyred by? Let me show it to you. Imam Ali also had that knowledge. Not because he gained it himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it to him as one edge by which as an imam of the time, he understands the Ruh al-Qudus, how to lead the society. So when Ibn Muljim enters the city, he joins the Khawarij group. He was among the Khawarij. But as you know, he came begging for money from Imam Ali because he was the head. As you know, Imam Ali moved the capital from Medina to Kufa. So Ibn Muljim comes asking Imam Ali for more money from the treasury. He says, you are the person in charge, wasta. I need some wasta, you know. You know me, I know you, you know, we rub shoulders. Give me a little extra, you know, like we do wasta in our systems, everybody. I know this guy, I can do a little favor. You know, wasta business. You see it at the airport when you stand, suddenly some guy comes and says, you don't need to stand in line, come. It's wasta, special treatment. So Imam says, I don't give wasta, sorry. He says, look, you know, I, I need some extra money. Imam says, you are strong. Here's some extra money I will loan you. Go buy a shovel and work in the farms. Make extra money. Ibn Muljim was a lazy man. He didn't want that. 
Muawiyah gets wind of this. He calls him, says, come on, buddy. I've got plenty of money for you. How much do you want? Sends him to Egypt, prepares him, and then sends him with a poison sword. They say poison at that time was very expensive. You couldn't buy poison by your average salary. You needed a lot of money to buy poison. So Ibn Muljim is supplied with poison, and he applies the poison on his sword to be sent to Kufa to kill Imam Ali alayhi salam. Because Muawiyah said, as long as this man is alive, I cannot do what I want to do. This man stops me. Yeah, just like Prophet stops Iblis, Imam stops Iblis. So Iblis knows what lies where. And he sends Ibn Muljim. And he knows, you can't touch this man eye to eye. Even Wahshi knew. Hmm? When Hinda told him, kill one of three people in Uhud, he said, Ali ibn Abi Talib, I can't touch him. He's got eyes even behind his head. He's too good on the battlefield. He will strike people in perfection. I can't reach him. I can get Hamza. So they knew you cannot face him. But the time to get him is in Salah. For this man is lost with his Lord. Then Imam Ali alayhi salam wakes up in the morning and he hears the animals crying. His family wakes up for Fajr. So before Fajr Salah, he goes for Salat al Layl. Before his Fajr Salah, he hears the noise of the animals. And the family of Zainab alayhi salam is asking her father, why are these animals crying so much today? Imam says, they are crying for my departure. For the Prophet has told me that when I become martyred, this will stain this. And he would hold his beard every day. He has tamannul maut. He's looking at his beard and says, is my beard going to be drenched today? He goes to the masjid and he sees Ibn Muljim lying on his stomach. Imam prods him and says, oh Ibn Muljim, stand up, get up, don't sleep on your stomach. But he has hidden a sword, historians say. Imam goes forward and he reads the adhan. Historians say that Imam Ali salam loved to read the adhan because he had a beautiful voice. Some of us, when we have beautiful voices, we don't want to read adhan. We think it's a belittling thing. Imam recites adhan. He recites adhan and iqama and he calls people for salah. Historians say that when he is in the middle of salah, he's doing his sujood, subhana rabbi al-ala wa bihamdi. Ibn Muljim rises from the back, and they say there were a few Egyptians there too. And I don't want to put down Egyptians, don't get me wrong. These were the ones who were following the Banu Umayyah. That they made pathway, and Ibn Muljim jumps, and while Imam is in sujood, <laughs> that moment of that strike of the sword on his head speaks so much to me. I don't know what to say. The entire history of this Imam, the entire deen of Islam shows up in that striking light of that sword that hits his head. That when he's struck in sujood, he says, Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba, I have succeeded by the Lord of the Kaaba. I have succeeded. He is happy. Like Yusuf was happy, he says, Tawaffani Musliman wa alhikni bis salihin. Yusuf alayhi salam is praying to Allah, let me die a Muslim. Imam Ali alayhi salam is happy that he's been struck. He says, Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba, no complaints to God. And Ibn Muljim is held. And look at the final point of justice that they were going to shred Ibn Muljim. I'll talk more about it tomorrow. They were going to shred Ibn Muljim. They wanted to kill him, to cut him to pieces for what they did to Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam looks at him while lying on a stretcher. He sees Ibn Muljim's hands are tied very tight. He says to his companions, loosen his hand, it's too tight on him. How many of us would be worried about a man's hand being tightened when he's the one who just struck you? How many men on earth, I ask this question to myself, that if I was struck by this man, I would want him dead at that moment. Yet the Imam is concerned about his pain. They say when milk was brought to Imam Ali alayhi salam, he offers it to Ibn Muljim. This wretched creature started to cry. This wretched man had tears coming out. He says, Imam says, was I not nice to you? Was I not kind to you? Did I do any injustice to you for you to do this to me? Now you will know what you have done on Judgment Day. Allah, 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 Allah,
My brothers and sisters, we have a sister Amal Fawaz, 27 year old single mother of two. As you know, she's in desperate need of a bone marrow match. I ask any of you who has an interest to go forward then, do a simple cheek, what they call a cheek swab. And maybe if you are a good candidate, she's been diagnosed with stage four non Hodgkin's lymphoma. On tonight, not tonight, anybody who has that ability, please offer your services to save the, the life of a sister. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will confer success upon us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabban aghfir lana wa li ikhwanina al-ladhina sabakuna bil-eeman wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghilla lil-ladhina amanu rabbana innaka ra'ufur rahim. On tonight's night, my brothers and sisters, the night of Qadr, as you know, we recite two rak'ah of Laylatul Qadr. After this two rak'ah, we do a'mal. It is recommended to do this a'mal. These nights are extremely important. Don't, please. I know many times when we find something important, we go after it, we stay a whole night just to get it. Tonight, nothing could be greater than the nights of Qadr. Please, even if you go home and don't stay, please open the Quran, do dhikr, ask Allah. One, one tear in sujood, a sincere tear from God, to God to say, oh Allah, help me, change my affairs. Rabbana atina min ladunka rahma wa hayyi' lana min amrina rashada. You will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us much success. We just have to pray. Tonight, as you know, our brother Salami is going to inshallah speak briefly on... Is he speaking tonight? We have the night of Khadr, inshallah, we'll do...